Okay, so hi everyone to the final event of the Social Science Data Lab Fall Series in 2021. My name is Andreas Küpfer and I'm happy to welcome you to today's talk by my colleague Dennis Cohen on getting the most out of comparative vote switching data, where he's going to present a new framework for studying dynamic multi-party competition. The Social Data Science Lab um, is an event series at the Mannheim Center for European Social Research that provides a platform for tools and methods for the collection, management, analysis, and visualization of data in the social sciences. It is organized by Dennis Cohen, Julian Bernauer, Cosima Meyer, and myself. Dennis Cohen is a postdoc fellow in the Data and Methods Unit at the Mannheim Center for European Social Research at the University of Mannheim. His research focus lies at the intersection of political preference formation, electoral behavior, and political competition. His methodological interests include quantitative approaches to the analysis of clustered data, measurement models, data visualization, strategies for causal identification and Bayesian statistics. So, all right, some words on the logistics. Um, you may ask your question during the talk by submitting a comment to the Zoom chat. Furthermore, there will be enough time for a discussion during the Q&A after the talk. Um, and a short disclaimer, we are recording this live, stre live stream and will post the recording our, on our YouTube channel. So therefore your questions will also be recorded. With that being said, Dennis, we're looking forward for your presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the nice introduction, Andreas, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's a great pleasure to step out of the role of organizer and moderator of the Social Science Data Lab and into the role of the presenter. Especially given that, as some of you based in Mannheim may know, we've recently decided to restructure the Data and Methods Unit. So um, the denomination of my position changes from in charge of data for parties uh, voting and elections to methods in the social sciences, which arguably is what I've been uh, doing all along. But it's a great pleasure to actually show the fruits of some work that actually has focused on parties and elections for quite a number of years now. So um, I'll briefly share my slides here. switch into full screen mode. So what I'm presenting here today is essentially two things. Um, the first being a conceptual framework that I've developed jointly with Werner Krause from Humboldt University and Tarek Abuchadi, previously uh, at the University of Zurich, now recently joined the University of Oxford, um, and uh, an accompanying R package that I've developed with the support of Nick Baumann, who cannot be here today, and um, Andreas Kupfer, who's our moderator today, and Tim Allinger, who's also in the meeting here. Okay, so the presentation is entitled Getting the Most Out of Comparative Vote Switching Data, a new framework for studying dynamic multi-party competition. And it's really the outcome of many years and discussions that I've had with both Werner and Tarek about how we can accurately capture the complexities of dynamic and polyadic competition between political parties in the increasingly volatile multi-party systems of today. So you may wonder, okay, why should we care in the first place? Why should we study vote switching? First of all, vote switching is a defining procedural mechanism of liberal representative democracies. It is actually a foundational procedural part of electoral accountability, which rests on the idea that voters can freely lend their with, uh, support to certain parties and withdraw it and lend it to other parties in response to parties' performance, their agency, or their programmatic offers. On top of that, dynamic mechanisms of voter retention, voter attraction, or voter defections are inherent to most theories of party competition and voting behavior. And with the increasing electoral volatility, Understanding patterns of voter D and realignment is ever more important for understanding party system change than it has been ever before. The problem, of course, is that even though it seems fairly obvious that we should care about how voters switch between certain parties from one election to the next, vote switching remains 
fairly understudied in comparative perspective. And we believe that there are three primary reasons why that is the case. The first is a lack of a conceptual framework and corresponding quantities of interest. The second is a lack of accessible data that allows for the comparative study of vote switching, along with high data requirements and concerns about data quality, and also the lack of an operational framework that is implemented methods that allow practitioners to study these questions using the data that they lack. So what are we going to do here? Uh, in the first part of today's talk, I'm going to introduce a conceptual framework along with the data set and a statistical model that renders this conceptual framework operable. That means we introduce a conceptual framework for studying the multidimensional outcomes of poorly added competition in multi-party systems, along with a newly compiled data set that marries comparative vote switching data with information on party behavior and party systems across more than 220 electoral contexts from 36 OECD countries, and a statistical model that renders this conceptual framework operable. And this is based directly on a working paper with Werner and Tane. In the second part of today's talk, I'm going to present Vote Switch R, an R package that I've developed with the support of Andreas, Tim, and Nick. It includes function and an interactive GUI for data processing, functions for model estimation, giving a Bayesian implementation of the newly developed statistical model, and post-estimation functions for the calculation of quantities of interest. And in the last part of today's talk, I will then use the vote switch R package to present an empirical application that is once again taken from the working paper with my co-authors, then I call the entire for each other. Okay. Let's jump right into part one, which is on the conceptual framework. And to motivate the conceptual framework a bit, we'll for, first review the extant literature on dynamic multi-party competition. Essentially, existing studies on dynamic multi-party competition come in two flavors. The first is aggregate level studies that usually focus on changes in party vote shares. And in doing so, they usually focus on the changes in vote shares of a given party in isolation or on dyadic competition. So examples include how do the vote shares of radical right parties change when their mainstream competitors adopt certain positions as opposed to other positions. What follows from this is that we're looking at a somewhat problematic approach here. On the one hand, theoretical arguments stipulate dyadic or polyadic patterns of voter flow, that is assumed or expected gains from or to specific competitors. But on the other hand, the applied empirical tests remain strictly monadic. That means that they only involve the analysis of vote shares of one party or of one party family at a time, either as a function of its own policy strategies or of those of specific competitors. The alternative to that is an emerging literature that uses survey-based vote switching data in comparative perspective. And we call this specific strand of emerging literature comparative vote switching. Why do we call it comparative vote switching? Because we want to delineate it from classical studies of vote switching that focus on micro-level variation within electorates, where the goal is to analyze which individual level voter characteristics predict inter-individual variation in the probability of switching your vote choice from one election to the next. What we want to do here is not focus on the individual level, but to analyze vote switching in the sense that we want to leverage contextual variation in parties' policy strategies, their agency, or their legislative performance to predict party or election-specific aggregate level patterns of vote switching across electoral contexts. So this study of comparative vote switching is distinct both from micro level inquiries into the individual level determinants of who switches their vote and who doesn't, and also from party level, level studies of vote share changes. Now, the problem is that aside from the criticisms toward the bird's eye aggregate level perspective, we also face a number of limitations in the existing approaches to using comparative vote switching. And we term these limitations 
unidimensionality, which means a focus on a single party or party family or a single diet of parties at a time, and unidirectionality, which means there's an overwhelming exclusive focus on dyadic defections, um, but not really a, um, a comprehensive perspective on the polyadic trade-offs of gaining from and losing to multiple parties at a time. The consequences of these limitations are that there's rarely direct support for the stipulated micro foundations of the theoretical mechanisms. And there's the risk of ecological fallacies in both directions. So type one and type two errors, finding something that actually isn't there or failing to find something that in fact is there. So a framework that adequately overcomes these limitations should accomplish three things. It should allow us to theorize and directly test the stipulated micro-level mechanisms. It should caution us or prevent us from um, falling victim to ecological fallacies. And it should allow us to offer a comprehensive perspective that captures the totality of multidimensional trade-offs in dynamic multi-party competition. To motivate this in a bit more detail, um, you have a number of Sankey di uh, diagrams here. And these um, illustrate patterns of vote switching between three parties, A, B, and C, along with a group of non-voters, M. And what we see on the left-hand side here, which reads T minus one, is the distribution of vote shares at the previous election. And what we see here on the right-hand side, termed T, is the distribution of vote shares at the current election. Now, one thing we will assume is that any sort of dynamic change that is depicted in these graphs, um, so any vote switching that we see is actually the result of a presumed cause. So there may be more vote switching going on, not depicted here that is due to other causes. We will simply assume that every patterns of change that we see here is the effect of whatever we think drives vote switching in an electorate. And here, for the sake of illustration, we will assume that the cause of vote switching is a strategic behavioral choice of party B towards party C. So we can think of party B as a mainstream right party, um, party A as a mainstream left party, and party C as a radical right party. And party B takes some strategic approach towards party C by copying its positions to take the wind out of its sail, to put it in the classical 1957 Downsian uh, language. And the assumption would be leveraging the standard spatial proximity model that when party B shifts its position towards party C, some voters of C will defect C and turn towards party B, which will, as a result, increase its vote share. And this classical assumption is depicted here in the first plot, where we see that 3.3% of the electorate at T minus one switch from party C into the electorate of party B, which consequently um, increases its vote share by 3.3 percentage points. So what this means then is that if we were to run a classical analysis focusing on radical right vote shares, we would see a reduction in radical right vote shares in this specific case as a result of party B's strategy taken towards party C. The problem now is that with this approach, where we focus on one party family's changes in vote shares as the function of another party's strategic behavior, there could be other patterns of vote switching that would produce an observationally equivalent outcome. And this is what happens in the second plot that you see. What happens here is essentially a story of electoral counter mobilization. As a result of party B copying the positions of party C, a large share of previous non-voters who resents this strategic move by party B switches into the camp of party A. Now, if we were still to focus on the monadic change in vote shares of party C, we would still observe a reduction in its vote share by 3.3 percentage points, but that would be driven by a pattern that is completely different 
than the presumed dyadic switching between party B and C. It's actually an artifact of the reduction in the non-voter camp and the increase in electoral turnout. Similarly, we could argue, well, one way to avoid this sort of fallacy is simply to look at all parties jointly, similarly to the dynamic pie model that Phillips et al. introduced in the AJPS in 2016. Now, this may work in a scenario such as 2.1, where the following thing happens. We see that as a result of some causal process, voters uh, switch from C into the electorate of B, from the electorate of B into the electorate of A, um, and if we were to include the, um, the, the vote shares of all of these parties jointly, that would then allow us to kind of understand what's happening here. But even this more sophisticated approach falls short of capturing what's happening in the scenario 2.2 here. Because here we have a fully cyclical pattern where some non-voters switch into the electorate of party C, some previous voters of C switch into the electorate of B, some voters of B switch to A, and some voters of A switch to N. And in the end, we have complete stability in the marginal distributions of the vote shares at T minus one and T, even though there is considerable switching going on from one election to the next. So this is just one illustration um, how um, the aggregate level or macro level perspective may fail to pick up on switching that is actually there or presume that there's actually a pattern of vote switching in line with theoretical expectations, even though aggregate level changes are driven by uniquely different mechanisms. The second set of illustrations that I'd like to present concerns the existing approaches to the uh, study of comparative vote switching. And we'll start on the right hand side, oh, sorry, on the left hand side with a scenario 3.1 here, which focuses on a fairly dominant approach in the existing literature on comparative vote switching, which focuses on dyadic unidirectional defection. So a classical example would be do voters defect from mainstream parties into the challenger party camp from one election to the next if mainstream parties do one thing or another. So let's say converge positionally. If we once again assume that every change that happens from T minus one to T is a result of the presumed causal mechanism here, we would clearly find support for this because some of B's voters defect B and switch into C's electorate. Now, this is certainly true. In this case, B's behavior would result in a defection uh, to C but it only tells a very limited part of the story that goes on here. When we move from scenario 3.1 to scenario 3.2, we see that at the same time, B's strategic behavior not only causes voter to defect from B and switch into C's camp, but if we adopt a bi-directional uh, perspective that takes into account both defection and attraction of voters, we see that voters shift in equal numbers from C to B as they switch from B to C. So depending on whether we look at defection only or at net balances of defection and attraction in this dyadic competition, we get very different answers to what's actually going on here. Now, both of these perspectives, the um, unidirectional dyadic perspective or the bidirectional dyadic perspective, really tell us about the balances of dyadic competition here. What they tell little to nothing about is about the overall payoffs for the parties involved in the theoretical argument. Now, if we wanted to know how B strategies not only affects its dyadic competition with party C, but also its overall electoral returns, we'd have to adopt a perspective as depicted here in scenario 3.3, where we concurrently take into account these records of voter retention, as well as their balances of voter exchanges with party A and the group of non-voters N. And things get even more complex when we concurrently wonder what are the electoral consequences for party C, 
Because one thing we see here in the last scenario, 3.4, is that as an effect of these strategies towards C, C also attracts a share of non-voters. So the story that we see here is the following. Party B loses from one election to the next. Party C gains from one election to the next. But these changes in the electoral payoffs or in the electoral performance of the two parties have nothing to do with dyadic switching between the two. So this shows, once again, that we may see aggregate level outcomes that are the result of different micro level mechanisms that we may have hypothesized and illustrates the necessity to actually leverage the framework that allows us to disentangle the micro foundations of party competition. And this is what we're going to do in the next section, where we uh, present a comprehensive conceptual framework for the study of comparative vote switching. The building block of our framework are election-specific voter transition matrices. And one of those is illustrated here um, in the case of the UK 2010 general election, where we have um, the vote shares of the parties in 2005 um, illustrated across the rows and their 2010 vote shares in the columns. You see the marginal distributions down here, as well as here on the right hand side. And within each cell of this two uh, of this five by five matrix, we see the percentage of the 2010 electorate that falls into a certain cell. So these 12.9% here are 2010 UK voters that stayed with Labour, whereas these 2.4% in the second column, first row, are 2005 Labour voters that switched into the Liberal Democrats camp. So clearly, this is something that we can never observe from official election results, but something that we have to estimate from survey data. Before we talk about the estimation bit, though, let's think about this in conceptual terms. Essentially, these 25 cells in this 5 by 5 voter transition matrix come in two fundamentally different flavors. We have retention cells along the diagonal, and we have cells that characterize dyadic gains or losses in the off diagonals. So as I said before, this right here is the percentage of 2010 voters that defected from labor into the camp of the Liberal Democrats, whereas conversely, this number right here represents the percentage of 2005 Liberal Democratic voters that switched to labor. Now, from these cells, we can define a number of basic conceptual quantities of voters. The first, of course, are party-specific retention rates, simply those values that we find along the diagonal, where, for example, this first element of the matrix here gives the percentage of voters retained by labor from the 2005 to the 2010 election. On top of these, we can define two more quantities of interest, namely dyadic trade volumes and dyadic trade balances. Dyadic trade volumes are simply the sum of dyadic gains and losses in any given diet. So the sum of these two numbers, for example, gives us the trade volume for the diet of labor and Lib Dems. And the difference between these two numbers gives us dyadic trade balances. So these 1.2 minus these 2.4 give us labor's dyadic trade balances for the Lib Dems. And if we switch the numbers around, we get the dyadic balance from the perspective of the Lib Dems instead of labor's perspective. And from these basic quantities of interest, we can then derive a large number of quantities of interest depending on what our research interest is by simply aggregating and normalizing these cells as needed. So if we wanted our quantity of interest for comparative research to be government parties' trade balances with opposition parties relative to government parties' own support base in the previous election at t minus one. We could do the following. Um, we could simply take the sum over labor's losses to the three classes that identify the opposition parties going into the election, 
So these are labor's gains from the opposition. This right here are labor's losses to the opposition. Uh, and we can simply normalize this by labor's or by the size of labor's 2005 electorate, and we'd get a quantity of interest of the magnitude of roughly 12, which means that from 2005 to 2010, labor's had net losses to the opposition uh, that amount to roughly 12 percentage points of their 2005 electorate. Okay, so that's the idea behind the conceptual framework. Based on voter transition matrices, we can derive essentially five quantities, gross gains, gross losses, retention rates, dyadic volumes, and dyadic balances, which we can then aggregate to match whatever our theoretical quantities of interest are. Now, to leverage these quantities of interest across many electoral contexts, such that we can study them in comparative perspective, we actually need estimates of these voter transition matrices for many, many electoral contexts. So what we did is we compiled a new data set that comprises 232 post-election surveys 37 of which are taken from the European Voter Project, 100 from CSES 2 through 5, but there's also 95 independent ne national election studies that are used, which come from a total of 36 different EU and OECD countries. And all of these post-election surveys contain information on voters' recall on whom they voted for in the most recent election as well as in the preceding election. What we then did in a fairly massive data collection effort or data management effort, so big thanks to uh, Nick and Tim for assisting me with that, is that we map these vote choices for a total of 1,500 and a few party by election observations, nested within 416 unique parties. And mapping means that we essentially connected the numerical information in the vote choice variables to external identifiers for parties from the um, manifesto project and from Paul Gov. So what this accomplishes is that it enables first-time tests of various theory of dynamic voter reactions to party strategies, to changes in their leadership, to their agency, or if you want to think more general, to electoral context characteristics in comparative perspective. And this is just a quick overview of the countries. Uh, electoral countries and the number of parties denoted within the circles that we included. Um, as you can see, it's a lot. And um, we really have both cross nationally and over time a very diverse set of political systems and party systems, which allows for all kinds of comparative inquiries. Before we move on, are there any questions? up until this point that I should answer? OK, let's continue. What we've also implemented as part of the R package that I will, um, that I will present in a bit is a data processing routine, which we acronymize as HIMRA. Um, and it consists of five steps, harmonization, imputation, mapping, ranking, and aggregation. So what happens that gets us from an ele election-specific survey to a reliable voter transition matrix is the following. In the first step, we harmonize formats of turnout and void choice items and auxiliary variables such that they become comparable or, um, or um, compatible across all of these 200 plus election surveys. We then impute missing values using hot tag imputation uh, in a combination with multiple imputation using chain divergence. And in the third step, then we map those idiosyncratic numerical vote choice uh, numbers from these election surveys to external information on uh, party and election identifiers from the manifesto projects and from Parliament. From this, we can already get raw voter transition matrices where we exactly know which cell refers to which pair of parties. But to make this a bit more valid and reliable, 
we reweight the cell counts of voters in each of these cells of these transition matrices such that the row wise and column wise sums reflect the true marginals. That means that the vote proportions reported in at T minus one and T match the true vote shares and such that the share of non voters uh, in both election matches the true number of non voters in these elections. And in the last step, then we essentially do two things. We first retrieve all party specific cell counts from each election specific voter transition matrix after imputation mapping and raking. And in a second step, then we aggregate these party specific counts according to a substantively meaningful scheme. So as you can imagine, knowing how many um, how many voters labor attracted from the Lib Dems isn't necessarily meaningful for a comparative inquiry, but knowing how many people switch from a social democratic to a liberal party is because that makes these things comparable across party systems. All right. And once we have these data, so these imputed, raked, uh, and aggregated cell counts from many election specific voter transition matrices, we feed this into a newly developed statistical model. The mixed aggregate multinomial logistic model with varying choice sets or short Movicle. So uh, what does a Movicle model do? It models latent election level cell proportions, which we denote as uh, PR, that a given outcome is equal to a certain category, which we derive as micro level or as average micro level choice probabilities based on these Himrat cell counts, which we denote as WJC. So essentially, you can think about it like this. Um, the engine of this model is a multinomial logistic model at the individual level, but we are not interested in micro-level heterogeneity within electoral contracts and simply focus on the average probability of each individual within an electoral context falling into one of these switching cells and we can then use this average uh, probability as an estimate, a latent estimate of the election level proportion of voters in the cell. And we capture these election cell specific proportions by election cell random effects. Um, and at the same time, we incorporate a little twist in this model, which is that we allow for different choice sets um, across electoral context, following an approach presented by Yamamoto in 2014. So what that means is that since party systems tend to be different and evolve over time, certain marginal categories in a voter transition matrix may simply be deterministically empty in a certain electoral context. So if we we're studying the 1970s, for example, where radical right or green parties had not yet entered um, a large number of Western party systems, then we account for the fact that we can still include these categories and these cases in a comparative analysis by ensuring that the probability of being in any attraction, retention, or defection cell related to these parties will be deterministically zero. And the model then essentially looks like this. You have your um, linear component for each cell or uh, uh, an equation for the linear com uh, component for each cell and for each electoral context, where we model outcomes solely as a function of contextual characteristics, so party, election, or country-specific characteristics. Um, we have the slightly twisted link function, which is essentially the softmax function, with the exception that we're only summing across those categories that are actually in an election-specific choice set. And the log likelihood then is essentially an aggregate level multinomial logistic likelihood where we use these cell specific or cell and election specific counts from the Himrad voter transition matrices as frequency weights. And what this accomplishes is that it allows us to specify this likelihood at the level of elections as opposed to the individual level, which means that Estimating the Bayesian implementation of this model is only a matter of minutes and not a matter of days. Okay, so much for the conceptual and statistical framework. Any questions up until here? <laughs>
Okay, then I'll continue the filibuster and talk a little bit about software implementation. All of this framework that I presented is implemented in a development version of a package called Vote Switcher. The Vote Switcher package presents data and methods for analyzing comparative vote switching data. And in doing so, it offers functions that allow you to uh, carry out the data management task and the statistical analyses that allow you to implement the conceptual framework that I just presented. Um, I am the author and maintainer of this package, but I've had great support from my student assistants, Andreas, Tim, and Nick, as well as from my uh, co-author, Werner Krause, who will assist me in, um, in writing generalized plotting functions for the package, which unfortunately are not yet included. But what is included so far are essentially three categories of function. There's two functions for data processing, build data file, which is a brilliant shiny GUI that Andreas coded up, um, and the recode switches function, which allows you to take the raw HIMRAT cells from these transition matrices and transform them into comparatively meaningful patterns, as I will show you in a second. For model estimation and post estimation, we have essentially three function. Run method code um, runs the Bayesian implementation of the model that I presented in STAN. Calculate pred error is a function that allows you to retrieve the mean average errors and the root mean squared errors of the model specific predictions relative to the raw proportions of these border transition matrices. In compute QI, is a fairly large function that allows you to compute several variants of these quantities of interest that I presented before. On top of that, we have three types of package specific data. Mappings is a, a file that has this mapping of vote choices from the service to both Polgov and manifesto project IDs. Codebook documents the various variables included in the mapping file. And data guide gives you the version download links and access details for the survey data. Because the problem is, and this is the only caveat where we cannot really facilitate the life of uh, the lives of future users of this package, is that we cannot distribute the data. So some of these, especially um, independent national election studies come with fairly restrictive use agreements where you have to apply with a specific research proposal to the data provider. What we can do, however, is give you the download link, let you know what you have to do to get these data. And um, essentially, all you have to do then is to retrieve the um, raw election surveys, place them in a folder structure that this built data file function generates for you, and then simply run the function from the shiny graphical user interface and you'll have a data set that you can feed directly into our Monaco model. So to see how that works, I'll give you a quick walkthrough. Um, the build data file function, again, we have been greatly assisted by Andreas, runs a shiny app that guides users through the steps required for data download, recoding, mapping, and imputation. And I'll give you a brief um, illustration of what that looks like. Once you run the command, run uh, so build underscore data underscore file in R, a shiny app opens that gives you this GUI on the first slide. What you can do here is select all the concepts that we included in um, or as part of the functionality of the package. And what we see here is we have weights which can be designed sampling post stratification weights, depending on what was available in the survey. And then by default, of course, you get vote choice at T and T minus one. And on top of that, we also included information and harmonized information on party identification, satisfaction with democracy, sex, age, left-right self-placement, left-right party placements, party like dislike scores. So to the extent that these are available in any given survey that we use, these will be included and can, of course, then also be used for other comparative inquiries. Down here, then, you see a context table 
where we have the 36 uh, party systems or countries in the um, rows. And we have the years for which surveys or post-election surveys were available in the, in the columns. So for the sake of simplicity, we will only focus on two contexts here, which are um, the Austrian National Election Study of 2013 and 2017. Once you've selected these two contexts for which you would like to process the data, you click Next, and you're being asked to provide a folder which holds the raw election study data. So here I have um, already defined my input directory where these files are already stored. If you do not yet have access to these files, you can simply click on Create Initial Folder Structure, which will provide a folder structure for you. And you can then follow this table to acquire the data from the data provider. So what you see here is that um, the data for the 2013 Austrian study comes from CSES, which you can download from the link specified here after you've accepted the terms of use. So you don't have to explicitly request data access. And the Austrian data for 2017 come from the Austrian National Election Study 2017, which you can um, obtain from this download link right here after accepting the terms of use. So once again, no submission of a research proposal or anything of that sort acquired. What uh, the table also tells you is what is the name of the folder structure that you generated using create initial folder structure. So once you've stored the DTA or SAV or RDATA files in there, they should show up here. Um, and once all of these boxes for all of the electoral con uh, context that you selected turn green, you can click on next. And you come to the final slide of the GUI where you can tell the function what you want to do. So do you want it to map these contexts, which you most certainly uh, will want, because if you don't, you won't know or you won't be able to relate numerical choices in these vote uh, choice items to external party identifiers. It also asks you whether you want to impute the data. And if so, you can request how many imputations do you want and what is the seed that you want to set. And you can also specify if you want to rake the vote choice data and if you want to get aggregate as opposed or on top of micro level data. And then you have a number of return options. Return data specifies whether you want to get the unimputed micro level data. Return data imp um, specifies if you want to get imputed versions of this data. The same thing then for the aggregate data, which are just the counts of the voter transition matrices. Once again, um, in raw, so unimputed and in imputed format. And you can also specify whether you want to have returned information on the imputation procedure. So once you do that, um, the function starts working in R. Um, what happens now is it's reading the data for the first context, which is Austria 2013. Now it's in the process of imputing the data after it already recoded them, so harmonized all the concepts. First, the, um, the hot tech imputation, now the mice imputation for the continuous variables. Now, raking happens, which tells you that um, you don't get 100% convergence, but it's still fairly close. And now the same procedure happens for the second context. And now we're done. And what we get here in the environment is a file called data file. And I'll tell you a bit more about data file in this presentation right here. So essentially what data file is, is it's a list and it gives you all the things that you requested as part of the function. You get auxiliary information, which is essentially just a summary of the arguments that you provided to the function in the Shiny app, which ensures that whatever you did there will be replicable even down the road. You get the micro-level data, you get the aggregated switches. If you raked, you will also get the raked aggregated switches, and you will also get imputed versions thereof. And 
This is, for example, what the first imputation of the rate switches looks like uh, in the context of Germany 2017. Um, essentially, we have a party number five here, which has losses to parties number one, two, three, and four. We then have the corresponding gains, so gains from party one to party five, from party two to party five, and so on. Uh, and you will also see that you will also get two numbers here that may strike you at a bit odd at first. This 98 means other parties that are not included in the mapping file and 99 are non-voters. So what this captures right here is the number of residual voters that switch to party five. And this is the number of non-voters that switch to party five. And the weights that you get here are the cell-specific counts from the imputed and raked uh, voter transition matrices relative to the total number of observations in the survey. Now you may wonder what are these parties one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, that's actually on the next slide, where we can rely on the information from our mapping file. So here I'm only presenting a couple of columns of this mapping file, but essentially we see that party number one is the Greens, party number two is the left, three are the Social Democrats, four are the Liberals, five the Conservatives six, the radical right AFD, and seven, the extreme right NPD, along with the respective party families, which we are going to use in a bit. So if we keep that in mind, knowing that five is the CDU CSU and three is the SPD, for example, we now know that our estimate for switchers from the SPD to the CDU is roughly 29 voters. And in the opposite direction, switchers from the CDU CSU to the X SPD are roughly 23 out of these about 2,000 voters. And obviously, I only showed the switching patterns that relate to the CDU CSU, so party number five here. You will actually get a much larger, um, a much larger number of rows for this electoral context, where you also get the full information for all the other parties. Okay. Side note, why is the raking step important? Um, because it transforms messy data, as you see in the top panel here, where you see the correspondence between true vote shares or vote share changes on the x-axis relative to the reported vote proportions on the y-axis. Um, and it reweights the data such that they look neat as they do down here. So what this ensures is not only that the voter transition matrix becomes more valid and reliable, um, but it also ensures that the macro level implications of your vote switching models will actually mirror what truly happens within these electoral systems. Okay, so now that we've done all that we've done, we've run the build data file function um, where we've mapped, imputed, harmonized, raked, and aggregated this data. The final step is to use these party specific counts that I've just showed you for just one electoral context, namely the context of Germany 2017, into a comparatively meaningful scheme. So once again, knowing that there were switches from the specific case of the CDU CSU to the SPD doesn't tell you much, but knowing that there were switches from a mainstream right party to a mainstream left party, which are meaningful categories for a comparative um, inquiries tells you a lot across specific party systems. So what we do here is we use our mapping file, which we've supplemented or which already comes with information on party families. And we propose a simplified um, scheme for party families where we um, group mainstream right and liberal parties as mainstream right. And we create a residual categories where parties for whom we do not have information on their party family or which are agrarian parties, diverse coalition, ethno-regional parties or special issue parties into a residual category other. And in the end, we will be left with seven categories, mainstream left, mainstream right, green, radical left, radical right, plus residual others and non-voters. And we will then use vote switchers recode switches functions such that the party specific counts that I just showed you before will be transformed into this pattern. So what does this mean? It means if you have two mainstream right and a liberal party in a party system, as is the case 
um, in many Scandinavian party systems, for example, the counts for these three will be aggregated into a joint mainstream right category. And if you have an agrarian, an ethno-regional, and a special issue party, these also will be aggregated for this electoral context into this category others. Okay, the resulting file looks like this. It essentially is once again a list of three objects. Data is just your election-specific data now, no longer in long format as before, but in wide format. That means for a seven by seven transition matrix, you will get 49 columns with um, the election specific cell counts from the voter transition matrix. Y names are just the 49 names of these columns. And Y structure is an object that for each of these seven categories, uh, mainstream left, mainstream right, ecological parties, and so on, tells you what these 49 cell-specific categories mean for each of these party. So here, for example, you get the Y structure from the perspective of an ecological party, and you see the name of the cell here. This essentially is the ecological party's retention cell, eco to eco, and here you see a number of cells that define their dyadic losses. Defection from ecological parties to radical left, to the mainstream right, to nationalist parties, non-voters, others, social democrats, and so on. So what this essentially tells you is from the perspective of each party in this or in the marginal categories of this voter transition matrix, what does a specific switching cell mean for that party? And in the case of ecological parties, the first is their retention cell, Cells two through seven are dyadic loss cells, where the diet column defines the respective diet. Um, cell number eight, which captures defections from radical left to ecological parties, is a gain cell for the diet of the left. Whereas everything that happens in these other cells that you see here, the radical left's retention or radical left defections to the mainstream right or whatever is a residual category that doesn't really involve ecological parties, electorates whatsoever. And we do that for all of the 49 cells. And that means that we have reliable information on what these 49 cells of a seven by seven voter transition matrix actually mean for each party. And that will obviously be important down the road when we um, retrieve our quantities of interest. OK, now that we have the data, all that's left to do is estimation, for which we have the run Mavical function. Um, it runs the mixed aggregate varying choice set logic model using R stan. By default, it includes election cell-specific intercepts, so random intercepts for each cell of an election-specific voter transition matrix. And all of the arguments are documented here, but I'm not going to go over them in detail. Uh, the main takeaway is you can um, explicitly specify what your predictor is and whether it is continuous or categorical, which can either be binary or multi-categorical. You can do the same for a single moderator, which can be, once again, binary, multi-categorical, or continuous. And based on this specification, the uh, the, the accompanying quantity of interest function can give you um, conditional expectations or predicted values, average marginal effects or average margin or average first differences, all of which can be conditioned on a continuous range of values of a continuous moderator or the discrete values of a categorical indicator, uh, sorry, categorical moderator. Okay, you simply submit this call to the function. Um, depending on how fast your machine is, it'll take a while for the Bayesian model to go through all of the iterations, but eventually you will get your estimates. And they will, of course, be very messy because you get parameters from 49 different equations if we're studying a seven by seven order transition matrix. So instead of looking at the raw model output, you can use the compute QOI functions, which computes the Mavical model's quantity of interest. And here, you simply pass your Mavical estimation object from the estimation routine, the Y structure that I presented before, and you specify a number of things on top of that, 
do you want to get posterior quantiles? Uh, so a quantile summary of the posterior distribution, or do you want to get the full sample of posterior draws? Do you want to get conditional mar uh, expectations, average marginal effects, or both? And if you want to get conditional expectations along the scale of a continuous predictor, how many values should the sequence have? Um, and some other stuff that I'm not going to get into the details of, but you simply use this function. Um, and what you get um, in this case now from the perspective of mainstream right parties um, is once again, a list that comes with three objects, the posterior draws of the conditional expectations, the posterior draws or quantile summaries for the average marginal effects and the predictor sequence that you requested. And if you wonder what do I get conditional expectations of, you get them for pretty much everything. You get them for overall losses, overall gains, overall balances, overall volumes, and the retention rate of a mainstream right party. And you get them for its dyadic losses, dyadic gains, dyadic balances, and dyadic volumes with each of the other six categories in the voter transition matrix. That is with ecological, radical left parties, non-voters, other parties, radical right parties, and social democrats. Okay, that sums up the functionality. Do we have any questions on that? Okay, then the last part is an empirical application where we actually use all of these functions to answer a substantive question. And the question that we're, we're dealing with here is the question about the electoral effects of mainstream party convergence on the left-right continuum. So positional similarity between mainstream left and mainstream right parties has often been assumed to result in two things a reduction of support for mainstream parties. And uh, it's been interpreted as a facilitation of the rise of new challenger parties. So in particular, left libertarian or green parties on the one hand, and radical right parties on the other hand. This convergence hypothesis has laid the ground for numerous empirical studies in the area of party competition. And of course, also in the party family specific literature on the rise of the radical right. Now, what's sometimes not really made explicit is what are really the micro foundations of the effects of mainstream party convergence on this aggregate level party system change that we've observed since the 1980s. And we've tried to make this fairly explicit first at the micro level. The assumption usually is that convergence leads to decreasing vote shares for mainstream parties and that these decreases are caused by one or two of two distinct processes, namely a defection from previous mainstream party voters to challenger parties, or the defection of these voters to the non-voter camp. And one thing that obviously goes hand in hand with this is the assumption that these losses or outflows of voters from mainstream parties are not compensated by corresponding vote gains. And there's little differentiation between mainstream parties. So the assumption is that mainstream parties are affected equally. So far, there is little comparative evidence, especially from a vote switching perspective on these questions, with the example by a study by Spoon and Kluver, which essentially argues or focuses on unidirectional defection from mainstream parties and challenger parties and finds that positional similarity between the mainstream left and the mainstream right results in more voters defecting from the mainstream party camp to the challenger party camp. But this leaves, of course, a number of questions unaddressed. Namely, do losses outweigh gains leading to negative trade balances? Or could it be that you have outflows which are matched by equal inflows of voters? Which challenger parties are the parties that benefit the most from mainstream party losses, if the general argument is true? And are mainstream left and mainstream right parties similarly affected? And we try to address this question in our empirical application. So the first thing that we show is a combined perspective on the mainstream party camp 
taking mainstream right and mainstream left parties as one. So by aggregating their cells, so to speak, um, with an overall perspective on the payoffs from polyadic competition. And what we see here then is the mainstream parties can, um, or the effects of mainstream party convergence um, on mainstream parties gains from all other parties, their losses to all other parties, their trade volumes with all other parties, the balance of this trade with all other parties, and their specific records of voter retention. And we essentially see two things. There is no effect whatsoever on overall gains, but a significant positive effect on overall losses, which then essentially drives these findings that we report here for volumes and balances. So we have negative trade balances because mainstream parties lose more than they gain. And since we have essentially zero gains with all other parties, um, the combined losses determine the combined volumes. And what we also see is that the more convergence we have, so the farther to the right we shift on the x-axis, um, the lower mainstream parties retention rate is. That means the less voters who voted for them at t minus one stick with them in the next election at t. So it seems that in this overall perspective, the argument holds. It is, in fact, a fairly unidirectional story where uh, convergence has no effect whatsoever on the overall gains of mainstream parties, increases their losses, and reduces their records of voter retention. So the question that we then want to know is, what are these challenger parties that benefit from this? Or is it not a, part, a story about challenger parties at all, but simply a story about defection into the non-voter camp? So what we present here are the average marginal effects of mainstream party convergence on the gains, losses, volumes, and trade balances in dyadic perspective with radical left, green, radical right, other parties, and the group of non-voters. And what we see here is essentially that all of this is essentially a story of defection to the radical right. We do not or hardly see any significant effects with in dyadic competition with radical left of parties or green parties or other parties or with a group of non-voters. But one thing we see is that where mainstream parties have converged, um, it doesn't really affect their gains from radical right parties, but it boosts their, di uh, their dyadic losses to the radical right, which of course then also boosts um, the trade volumes with radical right parties and results if we look at the difference between these two in a trade balance with radical right parties that is clearly to the disadvantage of mainstream parties. And we can then disaggregate this pattern for uh, by mainstream party family. So look at it separately for mainstream right and mainstream left parties simply by disaggregating once again. So all that I'm presenting here is based on one and the same model. And we see that this effect of losses to the radical right is particularly pronounced for the mainstream right and much less pronounced for mainstream left parties. So essentially, this whole story that we've seen, this reduction in support uh, in, of mainstream parties um, is essentially a story that is uniquely driven by dyadic defection from the mainstream right camp into the camp of radical right parties. All right, that concludes the empirical application. To summarize real quick, um, the increasing volatility in voters' allegiances to political parties and the corresponding rapid transformation of Western party systems confronts parties with major challenges and understanding the payoffs of party strategies, responses, or behaviors uh, requires a dynamic framework that allows us to take into account the multidimensional trade-offs that parties face. For this end, we've introduced a conceptual framework for studying dynamic polyadic competition based on voter flows. We've introduced a newly compiled data set and data processing routine and a statistical method that renders our conceptual framework operable. On top of that, we've introduced an R package that will eventually allow everyone to implement this.
In terms of outlook, what are the next step here? First of all, we are currently finishing um, an updated version of our existing working paper that will drop soon. A beta version of Vote Switcher can be requested um, under certain conditions. We'll have to talk about this because the package is still in development, but I'm sure we can find a solution. And of course, the package will grow on a rolling basis. So we will add new surveys and corresponding mappings on a rolling basis. We have already included straightforward extensions of the Marbacle model to the study of party electorates as opposed to national electorates or to the study of electorate subgroups. So for example, how do men and women um, switch? Um, so we can essentially disaggregate the story to demographic or social structural subgroups as long as the information is available in the surveys. And we will add plotting functions down the road. So that ends this uh, rather lengthy presentation. Thanks for sticking around and paying attention. And I look forward to your questions and comments.